So again, the title of the message today is You Better Believe It. I'd like to start out with something um, I hope is, is funny for you as it is for me. I heard of a faith-filled woman who, every single morning, she would walk out on her porch. Um, and uh, she kind of had this screeched, high-pitched voice. Her name was Lydia. And she would say, Praise the Lord! Praise the Lord! <laughs> every single morning. Neighbors said it was for years. Wouldn't you know it? A, a neighbor moved in from out of town, him and his family. And this guy's name was Jim. And every single morning on his way to work, by the way, he's an atheist. So every morning he'd grab his coffee and have his little briefcase and he'd jump in his car and he'd hear this woman say, Praise the Lord! Praise the Lord! He finally had enough. He could take no more of this woman. And he would say, There ain't no Lord! There ain't no Lord! This went on for weeks and weeks and weeks. This elderly lady, Lydia, um, fell on hard times. Financial struggles and trials. So the way she praised the Lord changed a little bit. She would still say, Praise the Lord! Praise the Lord! But this time, she said something a little bit different. She said, Lord, I've fallen on hard times and I need some groceries. So wouldn't you know that the neighbor across the street heard all of this and ha, plotted. <laughs> so after her, the very next morning, wouldn't you know, she comes out on the front porch. There's bags and bags and bags of groceries. And she says, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Can you see why this guy is mad at her? Guess who pops out of the bushes down here in front? The guy, I told you there was no God. I got you those groceries. He did it. She was amazed one single bit. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. You provided groceries and you made the devil pay for them. <laughs> God's got a sense of humor, doesn't he? <laughs> you know, so oftentimes people go to the Lord out of desperation. I mean, this lady was clearly plugged in and she had a relationship with the living God. But, but too many of us would crack to, to God only when we're desperate. In the meantime, we should be more thinking of the inspired to serve the living God. Someone once said, adversity is the good shepherd's sheepdog has a way of bringing the flock back. You know, I know that uh, everyone needs the, to possess a genuine faith in Christ for salvation. However, I want a faith that possesses me. Don't you? Don't you want a faith that is so strong that you sense and feel and know and experience God's love even in the deepest, deepest and darkest situations in life. So that's the kind of faith that this nobleman of John chapter 4 needed. So what we're going to do now is we're going to read John chapter 4. I'm going to read through all the verses 43 through 54. And then what we'll do is a Bible study and we'll um, take a look at all of them. But before we do, let's go to the Lord one more time in prayer. Father, we come to you in the mighty name of Jesus. And Father, um, too often we only come to you out of desperation. Lord, help us to live lives that we live out of inspiration so that when the hard times come, we don't have to be desperate. Because we know that you're an ever-present help in time of need. Lord, as believers, we sure can take it to the bank that you are going to be with us always. We don't always know why things are happening or how things are going to turn out, but you sure do. So we can count on that. So I want you to be here today as we read your word, illuminate it, fill it, encourage those who need encouragement, admonish those who need to be admonished, and I pray for your glory and your will to be done in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, so if you want to follow along with me, verse 43. 
Now after two days, he departed from there and went to Galilee. For Jesus himself testified that a prophet has no honor in his own country. So when he came to Galilee, the Galileans received him, having seen all the things he did in Jerusalem and at the feast, for they also had gone to the feast. So Jesus came again to Cana of Galilee, where he had made the water wine. And there was a certain nobleman whose son was sick at Capernaum. When he heard that Jesus had come out of Judea into Galilee, he went to him and implored him to come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. Then Jesus said to him, Unless you people see signs and wonders, you will by no means believe. Now the nobleman said to him, pleading, Sir, come down before my child dies. Jesus said to him, Go your way. Your son lives. So the man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him, and he went his way. And as he was now going down, his servants met him and told him, saying, Your son lives. Then he inquired of them, the hour that he got better. And they said to him, Yesterday at the seventh hour, or one o'clock, the fever left him. So the father knew that it was at the same hour in which Jesus said to him, Your son lives. And he himself believed in his whole household. This again is the second sign Jesus did when he had come out of Judea into Galilee. All right. So let's take a closer look at some of these verses. And... Um, Watch God do a work here today uh, through his word. So if we look again at verse 43, it says, Now after these two days, uh, basically, Jesus with the Samaritans from Sychar, Jesus departed from there and went to Galilee. For Jesus himself testified that a prophet has no honor in his home country. Now, if you take a look, uh, close look at the word country in the Greek, it really uh, implies that he's talking about the homeland or a region of a country. And in this case, it's Jesus and his family where they settled in. So they refer to it as country. Really, it would be more uh, county, if you will. So he's not, not a prophet in his own hometown, that is Nazareth. So when he came to the region of Galilee, the Galileans, uh, that is of Cana, where Jesus turned water into wine, if you remember, um, there was six pots of 20 or 30 gallons apiece, received him having seen all the things that he did in Jerusalem at the feast, for they also had gone to the feast. They're talking about the Passover feast where Jesus is flipping over tables and rebuking uh, those in the temple. So Jesus came again to Cana of Galilee, where he had made the water and the wine, and there was a certain nobleman whose son was sick. Um, he's not just sick. He is very sick. He is on his deathbed, as a matter of fact. And did you know that, uh, I think most of us know that in America, at least, statistics show that the average American is going to live to be in their mid-70s or so. Anything past 70, you kind of got a gift a little bit. God has blessed you with um, a little longer life. But the stats are not always reliable or predictable because we know that uh, death doesn't discriminate. It doesn't discriminate by age or color or race or national origin or what language you speak or how you think or how you act. Um, death sometimes is unexpected. We expect to face the death of our parents someday, and many of you have experienced that already. But we don't expect, however, to face the death of our children. Yet it does happen. And this noble man is aware of this fact. That's not a new reality. That's not anything that he's in. So, so he's concerned. And I, I want to turn back a little bit. Firsthand, I, I, I remember and I know and I've experienced what it's like to watch the loss of a child. And as a matter of fact, uh, at the end of October 2017, we received a call from a dear brother, Oscar Leva, and his wife, Janina, um, were headed to the hospital in the Victoria of the Garden that their little four-month-old Rebecca was unresponsive. So day after day after day after day of being on our knees in prayer, asking the Lord to intercede, and do a work and bring back their little precious girl. Yet, to no avail, God took home little Rebecca. So sometimes God heals. You see, God, God heals in two different ways. One, He heals by taking someone home, or He heals and allows them to live this life here on earth. So we gather with Laban family, we remember Rebecca. And one of the most difficult memorial services that I have ever experienced. Yet, 
we know and trust that God is good. He is faithful. His caring is kind. He's an ever-present help in time of need. So today uh, I invited um, the family to come in. And this is what that precious little girl looked like. And um, the, the precious... Now you, know, now you know why I brought the tissues up, right? So um, Oscar and Janina, uh, they came today and um, as a testimony that they, they're, they're still loving Jesus. They're still following Him. They're still trusting Him. They're still loving Him. They're still sharing the goodness of God. So I want to offer to you at the end of the service today, they're going to be up here. So if any of you have experienced loss, you're not trying to deal with, you need an encouraging word, or you want to encourage them. I mean, uh, we shared, my wife Brenda and I shared with them that at some point in their lives, uh, the test that they were going through was one day going to be a testimony. And the mess that they experienced was going to be a message. So that this could be a way that they could minister to somebody here today that doesn't know how to deal with the loss of a loved one. And again, I'd love for you all to encourage them. So the story today is different in that we're going to see this, this um, ruler's son live. So if you're taking notes on the plight of the nobleman, if you, if you want to, that would be your first Real solid note would be the plight of noblemen in 40, verses 47 through 49. Soon after Jesus arrived in Cana, a royal official, this nobleman, traveled to Capernaum to meet Jesus. The man was likely or ironically an official of Herod, um, who had just locked up John the Baptizer. Now, the Tetrarch of Galilee, who put him in prison. So, if this be true, he would have been not just a ruler, but a significant ruler, somebody who was really powerful. And we know that he came to Jesus uh, for serious reasons. He hastily traveled from Capernaum to Cana, about an 18-mile trip. And this is a busy guy. And um, you see the word for sick here in the Greek is the imperfect tense, which really means the official son had been not just really sick, but sick for a long time as well. So this guy had tons of money, access to the greatest doctors, the greatest hospitals, and he was still stuck couldn't find someone to heal his son. So he heard about Jesus and he went to seek him. How many of us know that Jesus' arms are always open wide? He says, come to me. All you are heavy laden and burdened, I'll give you rest. He had heard the reputation about Jesus. C.S. Lewis observed how hard it is to turn our thoughts to God when everything is going well with us. Listen, my dear Calvary family, the time to prepare for hard times is in good times. The time to prepare for hard times is in good times. Preparation doesn't begin when you're going through hard times and difficult times. That's how we deal with trials. Because, because we all know they're coming as much as we don't want them to be. Are you developing, developing a relationship with the living God in preparation for this whole time? Those hard times. Because you really are going to need it. Now, if you're struggling and having difficulty right now, um, and you're, you've been shy about wanting to get prayer, I really want to encourage you to come up to the end of service today. Get a hug from somebody. Get encouraged. Get blessed. Because that's how God reaches out. So, in verse 47, it says, when, they, when he had heard that Jesus had come out of Judea in Galilee, he went to him and implored him to come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. He was right at the brink of death. So reports reaching the nobleman brought him hope. And we learned last week that hope deferred makes the heart sick. But I know that when we know Jesus and his faithfulness and his love and his mercy and his grace, we can be hopeful. People need hope in this world. They need the good news. And really, ultimately, church family, if it's not us telling people about Jesus, who's it going to be? I'd be willing to bet that if I sat down with every single one of you individually and we were to ask the question, 
when's the last time, or have you ever had anyone offer prayer for you, what would your answer be? I'd be willing to bet that 9% of you say you've never had anybody offer prayer for you outside of a church family. I'd be also willing to bet that if I were to interview every single one of you, and you were asked, hey, when's the last time you were invited to church? What would your answer be? I mean, we, we underestimate the impact of a tiny little card like this and an encouraging word. We're fearful somehow. That's a big, bad, scary world. I know, but again, people are putting it on the game face. We have the opportunity to impact for Jesus. That same Holy Spirit, that dunamis power, that dynamite power that raised Jesus from the dead is living inside of us. When we come to faith in Jesus, we have the power of the Holy Spirit to overcome trials and adversities and difficulties and to live and reflect Jesus in our lives. People need hope. Now, since his official son was very sick and the father deeply loved his son, he started begging and imploring Jesus to come home and heal his son as he was simply desperate. So here in verse 48, Jesus rebukes the crowd of people that were there. He was strangely frank and seemingly unsympathetic. It's kind of, well, it seems to get, go against his character. Verse 48 says, Then Jesus said to him, Unless you people see signs and wonders, you will by no means believe. You know, um, about a hundred years later, there was something called bread and circuses where the Roman Empire would actually entertain the, the, the slaves, if you will, the really poor people of the day, they would feed them and they, and they would entertain them. So it's kind of the implication here is that uh, they, they just want to be entertained. They want to say, yay, good trick, good show, Jesus. That's the implication here. So Jesus has no need. Now, now, I want you to notice this today. Jesus has no need to be in a hurry. You know, Paul later penned this, that be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be known to God. Are you going to God with your requests? He's, he's listening to 2 Chronicles 7, 14 and 15 talks about that. If my people who are called by name will humble themselves and pray and come to me. And then God, then it says in verse 15, then I see, I see, wait. So God wants us to come to him. Sure, he's omniscient. He can read our minds. He knows what we're thinking. He knows what we're going to do next. But he wants us to come to him. He wants us to be dependent upon him. If you're taking notes, the second point is the plea of the nobleman we're going to see in verse 49. So this nobleman is boldly begging Jesus to heal his son. And he's relentless about it. Verse 49 says, The nobleman said to him, Sir, come down before my child dies. So he kind of moves a little bit to begging to a little bit commanding. A little bit, I would argue. By observation, we can see the desperation of this nobleman. We can also see he tries to yield some authority and tell Jesus what to do. Have you ever done that before? Have you ever told Jesus what to do? Jesus, I, I want you to get me that job. Jesus, I, I, I want you to get me out of this mess I made. Jesus, you need to do this. Jesus, why did you get me in this mess? Jesus, this, have you ever done that or is it just me? Alright, so now that I confess, you guys are going along with it. I see it. We should not presume to know the mind of God. So perhaps we should lay our request at the foot of the cross, knowing that God loves us, cares for us, knows what's best for us. Instead, we should be still and know He has gotten and listen to Him. Because he'll speak to us if we settle down long enough. Have you guys ever been anxious as be anxious for nothing about prayer? So, man, that's easy for you to say, Paul. Uh, is anybody else anxious here? Anybody else here worried? So be anxious for nothing about prayer. So, oh, Lord, this is a terrible tragedy. How am I supposed to thank you for that? That's what the Lord's telling us to do. We've got to lay our request at the foot of the cross. Jesus implores us in Matthew 11, 28 and 29. I mean, I, I, I just alluded to it a minute ago, but I, I would like for this to really sink in. Where Jesus says to you and I, followers of Jesus, Christians, come to me, all you who labor. Anybody labor in here? 
You might have a job, but you go to school, man. School can be hard work, right? It's labor. No wages at the end of it, though, is there? And are heavy laden. Yes, yeah, students are going around. Heavy laden, and I will give you rest. For I am gentle, the second part of verse 29. I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find not just rest, physical rest, but rest for your soul. Can anybody use that in here? Could you use rest for your soul? Could you bask in the presence of the living God and rest and sense his presence? So Jesus says, sir, come down before my child dies. Come down is simply referring to a lower altitude there in Capernaum, which is off the shore of Galilee. And actually, it's remarkably low altitude of 686 feet below sea level, which is mind-boggling. And Cana is about 900 feet above sea level. So when he says going down, it's, it's a lateral move. It's more uh, west to east. But when he says going down, it's because it's a $1,500 drop, drop in train. So if you carefully look at this passage, we'll also discover that the Father believed that Jesus needed to make the trip to Capernaum um, to be in his son's presence to heal him. Did, did you notice that? He says, come down. because So in his mind frame, and perhaps ours as well, we, we, we think Jesus... You know, we need to have the, the troops show up here. We need Jesus to show up here. Physical work just can't be done because it's outside of our ability to, to process. The nobleman finds out that Jesus, however, did not need to be in his son's presence in order to heal him. What a fat, it's just fascinating how Jesus responded. Some people would be actually offended by the way Jesus uh, just sends him along. And he did not offer to go with him. Remember, this uh, This man is probably a no-nonsense military guy. You know, yes, sir, commander, kind of, yes, sir, you said it, I know it, I believe it is, we got this. Yet Jesus zeroes in on the Father's relationship with the Heavenly Father. For without it, his son might be healed and never come to faith in Jesus and spend eternity separated from the living God. Jesus is always mindful of that, and so should we. Jesus cares about this man's eternal home. They shared the gospel. He certainly shared the gospel with this, with this man. He had to share the good news with this man. If you're taking notes, the third point is the path of the nobleman. In verse 50, Jesus said to him, Go your, look, can you guys picture this? Okay? Go your way, your son lives. That is a hallelujah moment. He was not like the usual crowd there that needed a show, that needed signs in order to actually believe. And there were those in Jerusalem who needed uh, convincing on demand. And, you know, they wanted signs and wonders. Oh, show me, do the show. We want to be razzle-dazzled. But Jesus was uh, just spoke the word, and this man was, son was healed. This man is going to find out later that Jesus Christ walked on water. He gave sight to the blind, hearing to the deaf. People with lep leprosy was cleansed. This woman who was bleeding for 12 years, touched the robe of Jesus, was healed. And he raised people from the dead. But perhaps the most miraculous thing this, this nobleman probably heard later on was that this Savior walked right out of the grave as we were singing in the worship song today. This man fully trusted Jesus at his word. So this is what it says. So the man believed. Say believed. believed. And that believed the word that Jesus spoke to him, and he went his way. Sometimes Jesus heals people with their resurrected bodies, meaning they are taken to their heavenly home, as we said earlier, and others are healed like this nobleman's son. Now later in John's Gospel, we'll read that the Holy Spirit recorded many of these uh, miracles and signs um, as objective proofs. We can look at John chapter 20, verses 30 and 31. And truly Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in the, this book. But these things were written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, by believing you may have life in his name. So objective proofs have been given to us so that we would believe that Jesus is both God in the flesh and Messiah and Savior. I've been asked over the years, and I bet you many of you have as well, you know, if I just saw Jesus walk on water, then I would believe. If I just saw Jesus turn that water into wine, I would believe. 
If, if I just saw Jesus heal that blind person, then, then I would believe. Or the deaf person. Have you guys ever experienced that? Oh, if I, if I had just seen Jesus after his resurrection, then I would believe. But unfortunately, with that argument, in the book of Acts, there was recorded after his resurrection, 500 witnesses saw him. It only takes two or three people to convict somebody of, in, in law. So you have 500 witnesses, yet there's a multitude of people, hundreds and hundreds and thousands of people, who saw and witnessed all this and left unchanged. You see, when we come to know the Savior, something inside should be changed. We should have a new heart, a new life, a new disposition. Life's going to beat us down. That's why we've got to be in God's Word on a regular basis to be filled up. So when it comes to signs and wonders, uh, I, I don't want to make sure that you don't, you don't think that I don't believe that God heals. But here's the argument that I have, is that when people have faith in their faith, that can lead to pride. But when people have faith in living God's ability to heal just like that, that's going to bring peace. You know, over and over again you see um, faith in faith leads to massive frustrations. Because sometimes God's not going to answer the prayers that we want and the way we want it and we get disillusioned or frustrated. We have to trust in God's sovereignty. Wouldn't you agree with me on that? Jesus walked on water, he gave sight to the blind, hearing and deaf to the people. Jesus was good and knew exactly how to answer prayers. So another observation we want to make here in the text is the fact that we know that Cana was only a few hours from Capernaum. This is one of the most fascinating parts of the whole entire message that I did not, I don't think I ever saw, and I've been, been walking with Jesus for 29 years now, I, did, I never saw this. So because Cana was only a few hours away from Capernaum, and the nobleman could easily have made it home before nightfall, and, and the healing took place at 1 o'clock p.m. So perhaps Jesus had this lengthy dialogue with this man, and he told him everything about his life. Maybe he shared with him, maybe he encouraged him, but this man did not go home to hurry up to go see his healed son, which perhaps could be allude, allude to the fact that he's not really trusting Jesus. And this man put co such confidence in his words that he spoke that he didn't even re re return that night. But if he saw that around, though, so is that not the kind of faith that you want? That if Jesus speaks the word and you believe it and you run with it? That, that's the kind of faith that I want. And I'm hopeful that's what you want. So this noble man has the, it doesn't have a normal confidence to hurry home. As a matter of fact, in Isaiah says 28, 16, he that believeth shall not make haste. So what a difference between this uh, frantic pace to get home. So if you're taking notes, the proof for the nobleman is uh, found in verses 51 to 54. And 51 says, and as he now is going down, his servants met him and told him, saying, your son lives. And on his way home, he sees some of the servants hurrying toward him. Apparently, they had some good news, and good news for sure. But what could the news be? Well, the servant met him with the exact same words. He said, your son lives for David. Please take notice of the question the nobleman puts to servants. He says, then they inquired of them the hour when he got better. And they said to him, yesterday. So there's the answer right there. I said, yesterday. So that means... A, 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 another day has gone by. So he clearly didn't rush home. But this is the next day. Yesterday, at the seventh hour, the fever left him. And that was one o'clock, and that was the exact same time Jesus spoke the healing. Now, the implication is that, that, that the nobleman expected gradual restoration, but Jesus did more than that. Jesus did the miraculous. He received far more than he bargained for. I was mindful of Ephesians chapter 3.20 that says this. That now to him who is able to exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us. You guys want to be praying for power. And verse 53 and 54 says, So the father knew that he was at the same hour in which Jesus said to him, Your son lives, and he, he himself believed in his whole household. 
This again is the second sign Jesus did and when he had come out of Judea into Galilee. But this man responded just like the woman at the well. He told all of his family and friends and he believed in Jesus. Listen, the pain of loss of a loved one can never be underestimated. Some kind, sometimes God decides to take our loved ones home. So the pain of loss compared to knowing the knowledge of the presence of of the living God, dancing on golden streets, on the living waters, and praising and worshiping the King of Kings for all eternity. And one day, for those of us who have a relationship with the living God, we'll get to be, we'll have a reunion. So in conclusion, I want to wrap up the, the message today. I'm going to ask the prayer team to come up. I'm going to ask the worship team to come up. So here, here's a few nuggets of truth I hope that you can take away from the message today. And it, and it really is going to be a question. So the question is, did this nobleman begin with a faith in crisis? I would say you better believe it. Now after Jesus, after meeting Jesus, was this man's faith confident? I would say you better believe it. And was it not long after was this man's faith not confirmed? I would say you better believe it. And at the end, we observe that this man's faith was contagious. Would you agree with me? His, his faith was so contagious, he showed it was still in the I would say, you better believe it. An old man trusted the words that Jesus said, your son lives. So we as believers need to be encouraged to know that the living God loves us and he cares for us and he wants to embrace us and he wants us to be contagious for him. And he wants us to know that he's never present help in time of need. That we can trust him. Whether someone goes on to be with the Lord or whether they stay here. I want to encourage you, if you have not surrendered your life to the living God, he loves you and he cares for you. He has a plan for your life. So I wish you'd bow your heads with me and pray. And then I want to ask you as we close of the worship song. But if you need prayer, come on up. So, Father, we come to you in the mighty name of Jesus, and I'm so blessed to know that, Lord, you are a good God and a good Father. You're a healer. You're a lover. You care for us. Just like this nobleman's son, Lord, I would like for us to have the kind of faith that can trust you in the good times and the bad. So I want you to minister to hearts here today. Encourage and bless and be with every single person who's here. All this we pray in Jesus' name.